in the year AD 70, after four years of besieging the city, Jerusalem, Titus, the Roman general, destroyed the city and the sanctuary was burned to the ground. Thousands of Jews perished in the famine, building up to that ultimate destruction. The fascinating thing is that not one Christian perished in that destruction of Jerusalem. The reason for that, it is because they took the warning that Jesus gave in Matthew 24 and verses 1 and 2, that not one stone will be left upon another until all be thrown down. And when they sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked Jesus, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And based upon listening to the warnings of Jesus, the disciples were able to escape the destruction of Jerusalem. Within that same sermon, Jesus also gave some signs about the end or the closeness of the time of the end that we can use to escape destruction just as the disciples did. Welcome, my name is Damien Chambers and I'll be a presenter for this evening's presentations on five evidence that we are living in the very end of time. We're talking this evening about five biblical signs that we are living in the very end of time. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let your Holy Spirit take charge now. Bless your people and exalt the name of Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus warned the disciples in his sermon in Matthew 24 that no man know the day nor the hour of his coming. But he also encouraged them in Luke chapter 21 and verse 28. He says, And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption joy nigh. In other words, though we do not know the day nor the hour when Christ comes, Jesus gives us signs to indicate when his coming is near so that none of us need to be caught off guard. Similar to what ex the disciples experienced in the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70, because they took the warning of Jesus, no one perished in that destruction. So let's go with sign number one. That is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Sermon on Mount of Olives, in Matthew 24. That's the one we're going to look at. Um, the setting of this presentation is that Jesus was responding to a question that the disciples asked. As he was leaving the temple, the precincts of the temple of Jerusalem, the disciples sought to grab his attention and said to him, um, look at these stones, how beautifully decorated they are. And Jesus said to them in verse 1, let's keep it at verses 1 and 2, Matthew 24, go, go back to the Matthew 24, verses 1 and 2. Jesus said to them, you see all these things? The time is coming when one stone upon another will be thrown down and will not be left upon another because all be thrown down. And while he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples asked him the question, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So Jesus was responding to a dual question. The disciples thought they were asking one question, but Jesus knew it was two, because Jesus knew that the, gen the time of the Gentile would come. The disciples, all, the, the disciples always felt that the Jews were the only people of God. And so once Jerusalem is destroyed, then that would be the end of the world. But Jesus knew that, that the Jews would be rejected based upon the prophecy of Daniel. And the Gentiles representing the church would have the opportunity to demonstrate their own faithfulness. And then the end will come. And so Jesus answered both questions in one. Okay? And so he gave them in Matthew 24 and verse, starting from verse 4, he says, Let no man deceive you. 
For many shall come in my name, saying, I'm Christ, and shall deceive many. The idea is that Jesus said to them, wars and rumors of wars, pestilence, earthquake, famines, persecution, all of this will take place before the destruction of Jerusalem. Okay? But it would also be, become a dual prophecy because these signs will also take place before the second coming of Christ. Matthew 24 might seem like a straightforward chapter, but it is not straightforward because Jesus mixed two events into one, one representing the other, the destruction of Jerusalem first and then the second coming of Christ. But if you watch carefully, you can, know, you can discern them. So, so the first one, I want to let you know, and we are seeing now, today, with the COVID-19, um, we are witnessing one of those signs that Jesus indicate would take place before his second coming, which is a pestilence. And we have, we have heard of wars and rumors that we have been through two world wars. We have we have seen famine and earthquake and persecution and low morality and the gospel being preached into all the world. These are the first indication that we are living close to the second coming. But as I said before, these signs are dual in application. I'm going to go to, my, to, to the second sign, which is signs in the sun, moon, and stars. Because these signs that Jesus gave are unique to the second coming of Jesus. So while the wars and the rumors of wars took place both before the destruction of Jerusalem and the second coming, the sign about the sun, moon, and stars are specific to the second coming of Jesus. And so Jesus says, immediately after the tribulation in those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven. There are some schools of thought, there are some schools of thought who suggest that the great tribulation is yet future, and we are looking forward to a great tri tribulation that Jesus spoke about. Okay? Now, let me be clear, there are several great tribulations. Okay? In Matthew 24 specifically, the first great tribulation was for the Jews because for about four years, the Jews conflicted with the Roman army and the Roman army surround Jerusalem and lock off anyone coming in and anyone going out. The disciples used that as the indication that the destruction was near because that's what Jesus told them. When you see Jerusalem surrounded with armies, then know that the destruction thereof is nigh. And so when the Roman army retreated for a while, for, for, for no reason, the, the disciples fled into the mountains based upon the instructions of Jesus. And they did not perish in the destruction. But the Jews remained in the city, the Jews who did not believe. And the Roman army returned and when they returned they redoubled their efforts and as a result there was famine in jerusalem when the roman army returned there was great tribulation in jerusalem in that it, it became so bad that mothers ate their own children that's how that's how deadly the famine was that was the great tribulation for Jerusalem and for the Jews. But Jesus says that if those days were not shortened, then none of the elect would be saved. Because what Jesus did was to also use that same great tribulation to refer to the time of the dark ages. Jesus, based upon the prophecies of Daniel, knew that not only the Jews but also the Christian church, the Gentile church, would also face a great tribulation. For 1260 years, when the papacy reigned, God's church faced severe persecution. 
And that was a great tribulation. That was also coming, that Jesus mingled both of them and said, if those days were not shortened, no one will be saved. And therefore, when he said, immediately after the tribulation of those days, he was now referring specifically to the second great tribulation, which is the dark ages. When the dark ages ended, it was accompanied by signs in the sun, moon, and stars. The first sign appeared in 1780. You can, you can Google it. Or look up in, in Wikipedia. Called, type the dark day. Okay? On that day, when the sun came up in the morning, at about 9 o'clock, a darkness came over the earth as if it was midnight, rooster went back to their roost and everything went back as if it was night and people had to go inside and it remained thick, dark for the entire day. The only change was that at nine o'clock in the evening, the moon came up, but when it came up, it had the appearance of blood and folks understood and recognized that this was a fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy in Matthew chapter 24. Okay? And then in 1833, the other sign was fulfilled where you had a meteorite shower, which is another indication that the great tribulation that Jesus spoke about had now come to an end. And we are now living in the time of the end. And that's, and we're going to come back to that. We're going to come back to that. Okay? So that's the second sign. An indication that we are living in the very close <laughs> closing scenes of Earth's history. The signs in the sun, moon, and stars. A third indication that we are living in the time of the end or close to the end. We can find the clues in Daniel's what I call fifth kingdom prophecies. Between Daniel chapters 2, 7, 8, and 11. 2,500 years ago, God gave visions to this great prophet. But the first vision was given to the, to the heathen king Nebuchadnezzar. But only Daniel was able to interpret it. And the Bible tells us, brethren and sisters, in Daniel chapter 2. Daniel chapter 2 from verse 36 onwards Daniel says in that vision he, he saw he saw the kingdom represented by the head of gold and then he said another kingdom would appear represented by the chest and arms of silver ties of brass legs of iron then feet of iron and clay and in the days of those kingdom referring to the, the kingdom of feet and iron and clay he says that God will Set up a kingdom. A stone was cut out without hands. Hit this kingdom on, on, on his feet. And destroyed it And became a great mountain. And the interpretation is that God. Will in those days. In the days of those kingdom. Will set up a kingdom. That shall last forever. And that kingdom. The kingdom of iron and clay. Represent the nations of Europe. Or some theologians. Refer to the papacy. Because it, the clay and the iron represent the mixture of church and state. Okay, In the days of this kingdom, that God will set up his own kingdom. And so that's what we're looking forward to. The songwriter says, Down in the feet of iron and of clay, Weak and divided, soon to pass away. What will the next great glorious drama be? Christ and his coming and eternity. The songwriter says, look for the way marks. That's where we are right now. We are in the rulership of the feet of iron and clay. I have two more important signs. I'm taking note of the questions as, as you post them in the chat. And we'll address them afterwards. The other sign that I want to share with you is Daniel's time of the end prophecy. In Daniel chapter 8, 
and verse 17. Here it is that Daniel is receiving a very important vision. And the angel told him, don't worry yourself, Daniel, because this vision referred to the time of the end. Okay? And take note of that phrase, time of the end. Because we're going to see it again. Because again, in Daniel chapter 12, reading from verse 4, the angel repeated the same instructions to Daniel. He said to him, in Daniel chapter 12, he said, But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So what the angel is saying is that, Daniel, there are some prophecies, there are some prophecies that I'm giving to you that are not going to be unlocked. They are not going to be open to the understanding of God's people until this specific time referred to as the time of the end. And you might be asking, what time is that? How do we determine the time of the end? The angel responded to that question, in verse 5 through to 2 to 9. It says, then I, then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on the bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? So it's like an angel talking to another angel. Da Daniel always having those experiences, but with one angel asking another angel the question, but they are doing it in the hearing of Daniel so that he can understand. It says, And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever and ever that it would be for time, times, and half a time. And when the scattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all of these things would be finished. Pay, pay close attention. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? So Daniel himself wanted to understand. But here's what the angel said to him again in verse 9. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So this is a very important time. How do I, what's the difference between time of the end and the end of time? The time of the end is that period just before the end of time when we are sure that we are living close to the end. And based upon the prophecies so far, that time of the end started in the late 1700s. Based upon the signs in the sun, moon, and stars, when the reign of the papacy ended. And we're seeing now in Daniel chapters 8 and 12 that the angel referred to this time of the end and said the time of the end would begin when the time, times and a half period expire. Okay? This is a lot of information in one, in one sitting. But I'm giving you this broad overview so that when you go to study the Bible prophecies, you don't get drowned. So, 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 so what we have concluded so far is that the time of the end will begin at the end of that time, times and a half period. So the question is, when does that period begin and when does it end and what does it refer to? Well, again, God's, God's, prophets, God's Bible prophecies are amazing because reference to that time, times and a half a time is made about four times in scripture. The first time is in Daniel chapter 7. And it is made in reference to the reign of the little horn power. The second time it is referenced, it is also referenced in Revelation chapter 13. Um, I, I, no, no, not Revelation 13. Revelation 13 is 42 months, but it's the same time period. Is Revelation chapter 12. It is referred to as being the period of time 
when the woman had to flee into the wilderness. God is referring to the same time period right through those prophecies. Daniel chapter 7, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, it is referring to one time period and that is the reign of the papacy. The reign of the Antichrist during the Dark Ages. And what the angel is saying to Daniel, that these prophecies, these prophecies of Daniel are, are kept, they are kept, locked and sealed until the time of the end. And, and when that time expires, knowledge shall increase. And many shall run to and fro. This is knowledge of the prophecies will increase. Okay? I see your question. I'm going to repeat at the end. We're going to come to that. Just, just follow me here now. So the, the, the point is, and, and by the way, the fulfillment of this time prophecy was given in Revelation chapter 10. Because what you find, brethren, is that there, there's Daniel and Revelation are, are twins. You can't separate them. Because they are speaking about the same future. So, so you have to connect the dots with them. Revelation chapter 10, and I'm so sorry that the screen is not working where I could put it on it to show you. Revelation chapter 10 revealed to us, and, and, and just take note of it, and when you go home, you read it. Well, you're home now, <laughs> hopefully. Revelation chapter 10 revealed to us that, and the same angel, I could assume, because the, the angel said the same thing, who appeared to Daniel in, in Daniel 12 and declared that it shall be for a time, times and a half, that same angel appeared to, Dan, to, to John in Revelation chapter 10 and declared that there shall be time no longer, or there shall be no longer a delay. So the angel is showing us that the time has expired, that God had set for these prophecies to be locked up and sealed. And that period would bring us to 17... 98. So if you notice something here, there's a pattern. The pattern is showing us that Jesus was speaking about the same thing when he said immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun be darkened. The sun was darkened in 1780. And look at the time when the papacy lost its power. 1798. So, you're, you're, so God is pointing to that same time period as an indication that the time of the end has begun. Okay? So that's the second to last one. The final one, the final indication that we are living in the very closing scenes of earth's history is found in that same vision that was closed up and sealed to the time of the end in Daniel chapter 8. And verse 14, where the angel says, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Let, let, me, let, me, let me pause here to say something here. I, I, I gave you five signs that we are living at the time of the end. Let me, let me, let me let, full disclosure here. All of these five signs could be five different sermons. All right. So let me let me let me let me just um, acknowledge that if you if you feel that you're not following perfectly, understand that because of time constraints, all I can do is to introduce a subject. But I'm I'm pulling them together to show you that they all work together to to point us to the same. In the same direction that we're living in the time of the end. Okay? So please pardon me. On, so this final one, Daniel 8, Daniel 8, 14. Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This time prophecy takes us from 457 BC to 1844 in terms of the time that it covers. But... When you include Daniel chapter 9, which is part of the same prophecy, because Daniel did not understand the prophecy in Daniel chapter 8. He, Daniel fainted and did not understand it. 
So the angel Gabriel had to come back after Daniel prayed a long prayer in Daniel chapter 9 and continue to explain to him this prophecy. This, this time prophecy includes the time for the anointing of the Messiah. It includes a time for the anointing of the Messiah and for the crucifixion of the Messiah that took place in AD 27, his baptism, and he died in AD 30, between AD 30 and AD 31, three and a half years. Okay? And then the, the, end, of the end of that prophecy in Daniel 9 would bring us to the end of the Jews in terms of their special work. But the, but the full length of the prophecy takes us to 1844. Again, it is bringing us back to that same time period between 1780 and 1844, which is an indication that the time of the end has begun. That is why, that is why in Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, beginning from verse 6 through to 7, the Bible tells us, And I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto those that dwell on the earth, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Okay? So, so, so basically, basically, what I'm seeing here consistently throughout Bible prophecy is that God has cut out a period in history called the time of the end that he began to indicate from, from the time of Daniel. He said, Daniel, Daniel, hold, your, hold yourself. You're not going to understand this prophecy, but God's people who are living in the time of the end will understand this prophecy. And it is based upon the understanding of this prophecy in Daniel 8, 14 that was locked for so many years. The unlocking of that prophecy led to the preaching of the three angels' messages in Revelation 14. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come, the time of his judgment. Because Daniel 8, 14 refers to the time of God's judgment, the time for the heavenly sanctuary to be cleansed, the time for Christ to close up his work of intercession, the time for the day of judgment, the Yom Kippur for the heavenly sanctuary to take place. This is a period of time that we're living in and a special gospel message is to be preached during this time. We are, we are saying that this is a gospel message to be preached in this time because the angel told Daniel that knowledge shall be increased and many shall run to and fro. And this knowledge that has been increased is a knowledge of Bible prophecy, especially the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 14. This prophecy, according to verse 17, the angel said, this prophecy is sealed until the time of the end. And God's people, <clears throat> God's people, beginning with pioneers from Europe and America, started to study these prophecies. And ultimately, it was studied by William Miller, a Baptist lay preacher who started the Millerite movement surrounding the understanding of this prophecy, which I'll talk more about on Sabbath, began to preach that the hour of his judgment is come. To the point is, brothers and sisters, we are living on probation time. Because if the time of the end started in the late 1700s, <clears throat> sorry, it means we would have gone over 200 years in probation time, in the time of the end. We are living on the very brink of eternity. And we need to be aware of God, I believe, cut out this period of time specifically 
for his people during these last days. And God, listen, listen, God is in no hurry. And that's why he said in Revelation chapter 7, hold back the winds of strife until we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Those who ignore the signs, the Apostle Paul tells us that many will say, when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. It is my prayer, brothers and sisters, that you and I will be ready for the second coming of Jesus. We'll use this probationary time to prepare ourselves for what is to break upon the world because once this message is completely preached, it will be the close of probation because we would have gone through the final judgment, the, 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 the executive judgment that God told Daniel about 2,500 years before. Amen?